It is wonderful to be with you. And part of coming back, pastors really go on holiday for one major thing, is to get stories for preaching. It's like after 15 years, you need new ones. And so um, I've got some new ones, but I'm a, an adventurer at heart. Have you guys watched that 14 Peaks thing on New Netflix? There's a thing about a guy who climbs 14 Peaks in seven months. It's ridiculous. I love that sort of stuff. But I love the planning of it. I love the fact that people say you probably won't make it back from that, like the, the doubters. I love the process of planning. And part of when we were offered the privilege of the sabbatical, we were going to have a few weeks where we could disappear. That doesn't happen often in life. So we wanted to maximize it. And so I started planning, and I heard of this mystical place I've heard people speak about called the Richtersfeld. It just sounds like a place you shouldn't be, but you want to go to the Richtersfeld. Like, it's like a place people go to kind of die. It's like, I want to go there. Um, and, and there's another, then I, I heard of this mystical land, Namibia, the land of the brave, just dunes. I'm like, I've always wanted to go there. We're going to go there. So I started planning. I went on the websites. They say, you can come. We've got a car. It's slightly bigger, but it's only 4.2. It, it, it's not a 4x4 four four with all fancy things. It just wheels, normal wheels, like every other car, just slightly bigger. Basically, mutton dressed as lamb. A little bit. It, it can't really do what it looks like it can do. And um, so I went, I thought the right thing to do when you're planning a big church, go sit with one of these intrepid adventurers who've done it before, you know. So I'm sitting with a guy, and he's talking me through. He says, where you want to go? I said, Durgh, this felt. Namibia. He's like, yeah, that's cool. Talk, talk. And then he asked me a strange question. He said, what car are you going to go in? I said, well, obviously our car, it's got like slightly bigger wheels, got some power. He says, but it's not four by four. I said, well, the website said four by two, no problem. Bit of ground clearance, you can get there, no problem. So he was, didn't look convinced. He said, you know what? We're going away for five weeks. We have a 12-year-old four by four that has seen some time and done some tough things. But, but you can use it with your family to make sure you get there. I'm like, no, we'll be fine. That night, I had an unease in my spirit. So I thought I'd go on, and I wouldn't look at the websites that are trying to get me to come there. I'd go look at the feedback from those four by four threads. And I encountered some amazing people. Let me just give you their names. Kalahari King, 77. Bush ba Bushfelt Bobby, 231. Caravan Dan. And four by four Highlander. And all these guys know what they're talking about. And they are there in capital letters on the internet saying, do not go here unless you have a 4x4. Now I'm stumped. Next morning, pick up the phone humbly to my friend say, you know that offer you made? Um, was it serious? You know my kids. He says, I know your kids. It was serious. Okay. So we got lent a 4x4 to go, which is incredible. And um, that's, it's not about the story. It's about the fact and the truth that we could have done 98% of the trip. Maybe even 99% of the trip with our car. We could have done the highways, and we could have even done the dirt roads um, to the past. But I'm telling you now, at our very first hurdle of the Richtersfeld, we were done. There was no way we would have made it to the campsite, not even close. And, and I've realized that it's those last 2% of the moments where you take the photos, where you make the memories, where your heart rises and you get to see a view that is spectacular. It's those last 2%. And so this morning I want to speak about, Gabe spoke last week about, I need a ghost. I know because he made us repeat it so many times while he preached about it. <laughs> and this morning I want to preach about, I need, no, that's not the right title. I do, but I need a 4 by 4 kind of faith. That's the right title. I need a four by four kind of faith that can get me to the final 2% where most of the time we see the miracles. Yeah. Who knows that? The miracles don't happen at, as you drive out the gate. You're just on your journey of faith. Wait up in the morning, pray one prayer, boom, walk out, miracle, done. Sometimes, and that's the grace of God, but most of the times it seems like God allows us to go on journeys and adventures. Now, some of my, car, my, my friends in the church have bought cars recently for different reasons. Quite obviously, not to go on adventures to the Richtersfeld. One of them bought a car, and it just coincided around his 40th birthday. I'm not saying it's a midlife crisis, but it's a sports car. It says it sees four people, but really about 2.3. Um, I would have had to leave most of my kids at home, actually, for the trip, which would have been a problem. It's got bling everywhere that, that would have fallen off before we'd even reached the gate. 
the gate of the Richtersfeld. Like you wouldn't even get to the gate without the bling all falling off. The run flat tires would have been flat the whole way, which has been running flat the whole way. I mean, it's just it, the speed bumps of Sunningdale are a problem for that car. So it wouldn't have worked for us. Another friend of mine's got a very fancy luxury 4x4. I mean, incredible cars. Like they can literally do anything they just never do because they're always in sports mode with uh, like those thin tires on that if you took it over, it'd just fall off. It has a tow bar, but it's more like a neck for bling. Like you're gonna put like a necklace or something on the back to hang a diamond or something. Um, they got good ground clearance, but they, they always drop them lower down. And apparently the AA won't even insure them to go out of the country because they're gonna have to pick them up and it's like a sure thing. So it's not, I'm not gonna tell you what car it is, but it rhymes with over. And, um, <laughs> In my car that we have is awesome. It's Toyota, it's reliable, it's beautiful, but it is a 4x2, and as you'll see from some of the photos, we would have got stuck everywhere. So we took a 12-year-old 4x4 boss that had this one kind of uh, gear lever that was beautiful, like a normal one with drive and reverse, got that. There was this other one. It's like a mystical one. It had like LR, high range and low range, and like mega low range, and like get me out of here kind of range. It had all these other things. And, um, and it got us to the last 2%. If we hadn't have had that, we wouldn't have got here. And I want to show you some photos. I really am not boasting. I only put up a few photos afterwards. But I want to share with you, we got to do a bucket list thing on. I love rivers. The Orange River was in flood. We got to camp on the Orange River with my wildlings eating right next to me. We were able to camp right there. They literally swam in the river all day. We can go to the next one. We set up, I'm already stuck. If you look, that's the car we got lent, 12 years old, beautiful. It's already stuck. I had to put it in four by four to get out of there. If I was in my car, we're there for four weeks until someone evacuates us. Um, because in this place, you need your own water, your own electricity, your own everything. But this is the viewpoint. One, we, one day went for a drive, and I'll show you in the next video. Actually, let's play the next video, and you'll get a sense of what's on the go. Soft sand. Check it out, check it out. Come on. You're Jeez, that was one huge rock we didn't see. Don't tell the owner, please. <laughs> We've actually got one more video. This is my wife walking in front of the car because she didn't trust me or the car. She wouldn't stay in the car. It's called Hellskloof Pass. <laughs> the name gives it away. Right. But I want to tell you, we couldn't have experienced those final 2% and got to the viewpoints. We drove in for two hours through soft sand, over rocks, through riverbeds, through a flooding river in areas. We wouldn't even got close to get out of our campsite if we were in our car. I'm not advocating getting a 4x4. I'm advocating something bigger, and I'm going to share it with you now. One, a couple more photos. That's half close path. Then we went to Namibia. We went to the desert. We would have had to park over there and walked. Who knows that wouldn't have happened? <laughs> But we could park right there to the point that my one kid almost ended up under the 4x4. I parked a bit close. Um, and I got to climb. This is Big Daddy June slow there for a second. This is a June that most of the tourists stopped six k's before at a little June called June 45. But Big Daddy is six k's further with the softest sand you've ever seen in your life. We we're driving. As we we're driving, this one car stuck my ass like, hey, should we help them? I'm like, no ways. We, we are going. And we got there only because of the generosity of a friend, but this vehicle that could get you something. That, that, and this is dead flay. I'll tell you a story about that. We can carry on. It's just an amazing, amazing experience that, that I, we got to camp on the beach. The only reason we got to camp on the beach because we could drive on the beach to the camp. Now, I didn't know that. The websites didn't tell you that stuff. But it's pretty logical now, now that I've been there. But what's my point in all of this? You see... The adventure wasn't the car. If the adventure was the car, I could have shined the car up, driven around Cape Town, and maybe ramped a curb one day to show my kids it's a four by four. That would be, the, the adventure, the vehicle, was just the means to get on the adventure and get to the final 2%. And I wanna draw that parallel to my faith. It's never been about my faith. And it's not about your faith and what you can post on Instagram and how many scriptures you can quote off when someone's in trouble, you can just boom, boom. It's about that faith taking traction in the soft sand, taking traction in the high mountain parts, taking traction in the river valleys below, that when we hit the unexpected times of life, like the two last two years have been, anyone notice that? Like the last two years are like, where'd that come from? Didn't see that soft sand coming. I'm stuck. Yeah. Hey, hey, no, we don't collect you there. Sorry. Then what? 
See, and I've realized that in my faith and in your faith and in our faith, in the faith of the church, we need to have a faith that can navigate waters and territories that are in the Bible. Like when the disciples are in the boat and they're having to navigate and Jesus walks on the water like Gabe spoke last week, I need a faith that can get me through that and grow. So God needed to take them through that so they could walk into everything they had. And when the opposition came later, they had that story in their arsenal. God's calling us to a faith. If you were questioned about the last two years, where your faith had taken you, did you have to get towed out maybe? Needed to be rescued? That's okay. We're all learning. That's growing. But there's a journey, a pulling towards a faith that can navigate terrain that we couldn't navigate before. Why? Because of who our king is and who our faith is in. See, maybe a better way to ask it is, and I asked myself, as I've had some time, I've started a new habit. I've heard about it a long time. Some of you have been doing it for years. It's called journaling. I always thought it was like a little thing other people do. Like, I don't journal. I write notes. I like write preachers. But then I sat with someone who encouraged me to journal. Now I'm putting my feelings down. I'm like, oh. And in my journal, I realized, I asked myself this question one day, have I kept the faith? The apostle Paul in 2 Timothy 4, is writing a letter to Timothy, and he's gone through his journey. It's right near the end of his journey. He says, I, I have fought the good fight. I have run the race. I have kept the faith. Now, fights and good fight, that's quite cool. It's like a Rocky Balboa moment, so that's pretty cool. Run the race. Everyone loves a race, but kept the faith. What does that mean? I kept it in a cupboard? Kept it away for a rainy day, maybe? No, I kept the faith, and this keeping the faith means I've guarded it. I've watched over the faith. It could mean two things. Paul could be saying, I've kept the integrity of the faith, that the unadulterated truth of the faith, I fought for that. And I think he is meaning that, but I think he's also meaning I've kept the faith. I've held to my God calling and purpose of my life, regardless of the opposition, regardless of the challenge, regardless of the trial. I've kept moving forward. I've kept the faith, regardless of what was in front of me. See, Paul's trust in Jesus never wavered. Go read the Bible. It's spectacular. I mean, he faced every challenge from the day that he encountered God on that Damascus road where he was blinded through to his last day. His faith never wavered. He kept the faith. He faced mob violence against him, stonings and beatings. He faced big officials like Festus and Felix. Who wants to face a guy named Festus? It just sounds like an enemy I don't want to face. Like, I'll face Bob, but not Festus. It just, I mean, he took on Peter, the apostle Peter, when Peter was looking like he was going the wrong way with his gospel and his understanding of grace and some things, he took him on, but it had these meanings. He says, I have kept the faith to fulfill the mission, the mandate, to go the adventure of faith. Maybe, well, Paul was an apostle, but what about business owners? Maybe you're a business owner here. Hard to keep the faith when economies are getting beaten and broken and and, and deals that were sure thing are no longer a sure thing. As a parent in an ever-changing world that literally is changing day to day, as a human being in a world where many of the big voices and, and that used to control and we used to look and go, wow, they've really got it together. Now you're going, wow, they don't know what they're doing. As a coronavirus has hit and smashed and your faith has got to take traction and yet the question still comes, not because there were challenges at all. Did you keep the faith? I want to call us to be a people at this time. See, the enemy's always working to derail God's plans in his people's lives. I'm Paul had to navigate the Galatian legalists, the, the, the Colossians Gnostics, and the Judaizers. I mean, he could have just said one of those. I'm going, I'm out. Call someone else. Paul says, I kept the faith. Well, how did he do that? He was physically beaten. He was, it says in in 2 Corinthians, I was hard pressed on all sides. Maybe that's your testimony right now. Well, this is how he did it. As he writes to Timothy, he says, I know, I know whom I believed. Not what. I know whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto, unto him against that day. I am persuaded. What are you persuaded by? Or should I rather say, who are you persuaded by right now? Because that's what matters. That's what keeps. That's what holds. That's what keeps pulling us forward. 
And Paul had this understanding. He knew the story that one day he would look into the eyes of his father and his savior and say, well done, faithful servant. See, I want to, well, let me rather say this, I need a four by four kind of faith. A faith that doesn't just go well when it's good on the nice highways and, and it's, it's the N1, wide open space, let's just go. That's easy. I need a faith when the sand gets soft and it's right around the corner or there's potholes on the road or they're under. Sorry, kids, we're going home. There's a pothole. Dad. Sorry, kids, we're going home. The road is bumpy. That's one hell of a way to put adventure in your three boys' hearts. It's like, sorry, guys, it's rough here. Or you navigate that wonderful little thing next to this, the, the, what is that thing? Gear lever thing, that thing, whatever it's called, into a four by four mode and you keep moving forward. Maybe slower. Maybe the rev's a little higher. Keep moving forward. Oh, we got over that. We got through that. You see, faith isn't about going fast. It's not about being fancy and it's actually not about getting followers. Faith is about, is about pulling us into a story where we go far like to the ends of the earth kind of far. Faith is a story that we go through, like a Philippians whatever happens kind of faith. That's the faith God's calling us. That's a faith that'll change the world. It's a, it's a faith that's not about getting, just getting it over with. It's about getting over it. It's that kind of faith where we don't have to turn back. I think of the 12 spies. I want the faith of the two spies. They might have been outnumbered, but God was on their side. And I'm not trying to just urge you on today. I'm trying to remind us that our faith is rooted in a rugged cross. A rugged cross. Not a glass sandpapered cross so he didn't get any splinters. He carried that rugged cross up a mountain. It wasn't comfortable. It wasn't convenient. It didn't make sense. And surely there's going, this cannot be God's will. And so many Christians quickly do feel like this is hard. Where's God? This can't be his will. I'm going, really? Read the Bible. There's hard things everywhere. I want to call us to three characteristics of a faith that can be kept. Is that good? I'm not trying to G you up today. I'm trying to call us to a faith that I'm telling you the world needs Christians to have right now. If we are going to fulfill the mandate. We've got to be able to get through some tough terrain. Because I'd love to stand here and say, it's all going away. 2022, woo party time. It's going to be sunshine every day on the beach. Business is going to flourish every day. It's just up and up and up. I'm not saying that. I'm not trying to get you emo either. So stick with me. We are, point number one, we need a toughened up faith. And when I say we, I mean me. We live in a world that... We have mastered the art of anesthetizing pain, not just in the medical field, in the emotional field, in the spiritual field, in the physical field, we just anesthetize it. We just take it away. We don't always get to the root, we don't fix it. And I'm telling you, our faith is never meant to be pretty or sanitized and it's definitely not meant to be anesthetized. Oh, that one's hard. Change direction. We take our kids on journeys and going, no, we've got to teach them to get through tough places and spaces. I've, I've watched Quinton and their kids, their 16-year-old boy. What do you do with a 16-year-old boy? How do you teach them? Well, send him to pack ice for the whole summer. He has packed ice 10 hours a day, every day. For an, I think that's awesome. And I saw him the other I haven't seen him for a week. He's got guns on his arms. He's got stories to tell. He's got a bit of money to go buy his dad. I don't know what shirt that is, but I mean, I'm sure it's good. And John 16, verse 33, here Jesus writes, I've told you these things so that you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. <laughs> Maybe you want to go back to TBN or some other thing and some other preacher saying something else. But I want to tell you, that's Jesus. That's not me. You will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. He says there's trouble, but I've given you an overcoming faith. A rugged overcoming faith. A faith that you can slip into a different gearing, not even just go faster, but a totally different gearing that activates different muscles, different strength. See, Jesus knew that kind of faith. He knew that kind of ruggedness. It says, Luke 22, verse 44, this is Jesus. And being in anguish, 
He prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like that, was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he suffered in Gethsemane, when he suffered, so hard pressed, this, this body pushing out unnaturally. Father, take this cup from me, take the suffering away from me, but not my will. See, if there's not the but, then there's no activation of low range faith that we call to a rugged faith. Secondly, a characteristic of a four by four kind of faith is an enduring faith. Sorry, I keep doing this. I don't know. They feel like they're going to fall off. I'm like, stay there. But an enduring faith. I, I got into this four. I'd never seen this four by four until I said yes, and we were about to go on the trip. <laughs> it's pretty stupid, but it's all part of it. I got in. The first thing I saw was 265,000 Ks, and I knew this thing's done some time. I really hope this thing can go. <laughs> but the amazing thing, it went. Look, when it got 42 degrees and the aircon didn't work so hot. Sorry, family, open the windows. But we kept moving forward. Endurance, the ability to withstand hardship or adversity. I'm telling you, God wants to give you endurance. And a faith that endures tough things, hard things. Hebrews 10, verse 23 to 22, 23, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Carries on, 10, verse 30, uh, 36 says, for you have need of steadfast patience and endurance so that you may perform and fully accomplish, fully accomplish, fully keep, the plans that God has for you, whatever that is, in whatever area God's, God's calling to a faith that is rugged. But the last one is simply this, a faith with the view in sight. And the view isn't a panoramic that an, an iPhone can take. The view is simply this, Jesus. That's the view. Jesus that tells us in Song of Psalms, he is the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valley. Oh, but I don't like valleys. I've told you before, and maybe you've never, I'm not a valley guy. I'm like a mountaintop guy. I like the mountaintops, and, but the valleys I found hard. I find them tough. And yet, Jesus is the lily of the valley. He's beautiful in the valley. He's also the God of the mountaintop. says to Peter, James, and John, come with me. I need to show you something. I need you to see me on the mountaintops. Because when you've seen me in the mountaintops and you've seen me in the valley and you've trusted me, the good shepherd on the path along the way, and you've trusted me when it's dark all around, but I will be your light, you will know and you will understand and you will see that there is a life that doesn't make sense to this world. It's called the life of Christians who believe in a glorious God. One testimony this morning. Anyone heard of a lady named Fanny Crosby? You have? Yes. Yes. Fanny Crosby, she's this American, she was this American kind of poet and lyricist and composer. She wrote 800, 8,000 songs, 8,000 songs that have been printed over 100 million times. Not this internet stuff, just printed 100 million times. Fanny Crosby went blind at six weeks old. So one pastor, one preacher, he said this to her, he says, I think it's a great pretty that the master pity, that the master did not give you sight when he showered so many other gifts upon you. He was being well-meaning, I'm sure. She responded like this, said, do you know that if at birth I'd been able to make one petition, it would have been that I was born blind. It's confused. She said, because when I get to heaven, the first face that shall ever gladden my sight will be that of my Savior. I want the faith of Fanny Crosby. I want to tell you now, the good shepherd doesn't take us out. He leads us through the valley of the shadow of death. He leads us through and he provides water. And he leads us when we trust him. The good shepherd is looking for a rugged faith that will trust him. When he says, come, we come. The good shepherd is looking for a people who when he says, enter in, we enter in. Why? Because we trust the good shepherd. My faith is tested at that point where my trust is resting on his goodness. That's it. 
I can pray fancy prayers. I can even fast for three days without faith, you know? You'll survive. Or I can find a rugged faith. Have you got a rugged faith? I realized the last year we've had some challenges as a family that we'll share in time. We haven't shared a lot and they've been tough. And I realized my faith needed to grow. I needed to find some more gears. I needed to find a whole new gearing because this situation caught me totally off guard. But you know what I love reading about? I love reading about heaven. Not because I, I live today to be in heaven. I love living the life that I live, but I, I look towards heaven one day and it reminds me that there's an eternity with Jesus. And if my faith leads me to live a life, a rugged life, that scars might become the reality of that life, then so be it. Everywhere I walk, I have a really nasty scar from here to here. I went through a window when I was 16. Every time people take my temperature, I get these looks or these comments. I can't get rid of that scar. I can't get rid of some of the scars on my heart. I can't get rid of some of the scars in my thinking. I can't get rid of my scars, but in heaven, There'll be no scars in my thinking. There'll be no scars on my body. There'll be no scars on me. There won't be scars on you. There won't be scars on anyone. But there will be one who will bear scars. Just one. From a rugged cross. With nails through his hands. He'll bear the scars of the price he paid for me. The price he paid for you. And all he's ever looked for. It's faith. It's what he's looking for you. Will you trust him with your heart? Will you trust him with your mind? Will you trust him with your finances? Will you trust him with every idol that wants to set itself up in your life? Will you trust him? And if scars come along the way, will you trust that one day when you're in his presence for eternity, all scars will disappear? Will you trust him? Will you develop a four by four kind of faith? Finding time in the word, time in prayer, and time persuaded by the one who is seated on the throne. Will you stand with me this morning? We've all got our stories to tell. Our testimonies. I don't have Fanny Crosby's testimony of my life. And there's been testimonies that will be told and others that can't be told in time. And there will be all sorts of journeys. In there. But I promise you this, there's going to be soft terrain. There's going to be muddy terrain. There's going to be challenging times. God says in Ephesians, there's one thing that he's looking for and there's one thing that pleases him. Just faith. We can make it a million other things. Your works. Now he's looking for faith. Your sacrifice, yes, but your faith. Your love for others, yes, but your faith. That's what pleases him. A rugged faith. Can we lift our hands to the king this morning? Jesus, I pray this would be far more than just an inspiring word at the start of the year. I pray, Spirit of God, raise up a people with rugged faith, with their eyes fixed on the one who came off that rugged cross, out of that broken tomb, where you broke the curse of sin. You set your people free. Rise up, rise up, warriors. Let apathy come out now. If you know apathy is part of your story, allow God to break it out of you now and let faith rise up. Let courage rise up. Apathy in parenting, apathy in endeavors, apathy in our trust in God. Rise, warrior. And let Him get all the glory. God, you are worthy of it all. You are glorious. You're above it all. You're beyond it all. You're majestic. You are divine. You are healer. You are redeemer. You are restorer. You are provider. You are gracious and you are kind and you are slow to anger. You are abounding in love. You are more than I could ever comprehend or imagine. And I will get an eternity to fix my eyes upon you. But today I will fix my gaze upon the glory of the one who reigns higher than it all, greater than it all. We fix our eyes on you, Jesus. Yes.